good to us. We are coming to the end of the year, and I can't think of a better Sunday to be in church when we come to that place. And, you know, so many times at the end of the year, people are, are looking at uh, resolutions and all these kind of conventional things that people do or in, in, uh, in review of their lives and an overview of their life to see where they are and hopefully look and see where they're going. The idea is that we're going in the right direction with the Lord. So I want to talk to you today a little bit about that. And I know I've preached this at least a couple times in the last 25 years of Pastoring Believers Fellowship. But I'm going to preach it to you again. I believe it is something so uh, necessary to come back and recall and remember in our spiritual lives. And some of you are really taking seriously this end of year, beginning of year, where you really are reviewing your life and, and you're looking at where you are and where you're headed. And perhaps even in the midst of that review, you're looking and, and you notice that right now you are in the midst of some very difficult struggles in your life. They come, they go. There's, there's seasons, it seems, that we go through, different times. And every one of us experience those difficulties. And every one of us have crisis in our life. And I know uh, that all of us like to think that we're the only ones that are possibly going through this kind of dilemma in our life. But the Bible says these things happen to all of us, that temptation's common to every man, that trials are common to every man. But what do we do in these times? And I think what do we need to remember in these times? Well, a great illustration of this is found in, in the book of Joshua. The children of Israel have been wandering for 40 years. They've long left the Egyptians behind in the, in the Red Sea, those that were trying to follow. They've gone through one trial after another trial, and that passage in Psalms that I mentioned before uh, during the baby dedication was a time where it goes back and the psalmist is rehearsing the successes and the failures and the deliverance and the mercies of God and, and, and the testimonies. But, you know, now they're at this place. They've come out of the wilderness. They have a new leader. His name's Joshua. And he's in charge of leading the people into this promised land. It was a covenant promise from God this land was. But it's not going to be just a, a, a nice little gift that's going to be handed over to them. The promised land was a land of battles. That's why, you know, sometimes people when they talk about them going to the promised land, they, they're talking about heaven. Well, the promised land is not a picture, a type, nor a symbol of heaven. It's a picture of the Christian life the Spirit-filled Christian life, that we go in and God says in this new life where Jesus is Lord in your life and the Spirit's controlling your life, it's a land of overcoming. It's a land of victory. You're going to have battles, but you know, there's going to be victories that come along with the battle. So you need to understand the, that in the context of really surrendering everything to Christ, there will be problems and there's going to be difficulties. But every one of those, as we know from Scripture, are there to hone us and sharpen us and make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are a lot of difficulties, and there are a lot of strongholds and a lot of struggles. Let me read you just a portion of Joshua. From chapter 5, and it's not on the screen. I know some of you have gotten spoiled by me putting the Scriptures up each week. But, you know, you ought to carry a Bible to church just in case I do this, all right? In fact, you ought to carry a Bible everywhere you go. It just keeps you out of trouble. <laughs> Amen? Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. And it says in this passage, as he's talking about, the, remember, he's just left the wilderness. They're standing on the, uh, on, in the promised land, looking at the first encounter they're going to have. And in verse 13, it says, And it came about that when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, rather I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now this captain of the Lord's army here is... I believe, uh, the pre-incarnate Jesus, all right? This is prior to Bethlehem and Jesus being born as a baby. I think most of you understand that Jesus just didn't come about in Bethlehem at Christmas some couple thousand years ago. The Bible says he was in the beginning with God. The scripture says that all things were made by him and without him was not anything that was made. He was in the beginning. He was the word. He was the word of God and the word was with God. All things were made by him. In other words, Jesus is eternal. In the, as the triune God is eternal, he's an eternal part of the Godhead. It was in Bethlehem that he took on flesh and he became a man so that that he might purchase the price do our sins and redeem us from sin. But this is before. This is before Bethlehem. This is, bef this, is, this is prior to that moment. And this is one of those places in the Old Testament where you see Jesus on the scene. 
I didn't say an angel, because if it were an angel, he wouldn't have been allowed to bow down. Anytime any man sought to bow down and worship an angel, the angels of the Lord always stopped them. They always, they always stopped what they were doing and sought to, to hinder what was going on because they didn't want to worship anybody but the Lord God himself. So here we have this Jesus, and he's speaking to Joshua, and he's telling him about the battles that is coming before him, and he goes into detail of how he wants this particular battle to be fought and how it should be won. There's a great, uh, great uh, quote from John Chrysostom about battles in the Christian life. He said this, You are but a poor soldier of Christ. If you think you can overcome without fighting, and you suppose you can have the crown without a conflict. In other words, there's going to be battles. There can't be any victories awarded if there's no battles that have been fought. And you face, and I face, no matter how spiritual you might be, you still face conflicts every day in every life. Some of them are minimal, some of them are minor, some of them are huge. Some of them look impossible. Some look like there's just no way to get through this, to get around this, to deal with this. This is exactly what Jer Jericho uh, represents to Joshua. It looks like an impenetrable fortress. And by all means and measures, it is. There's, there's no way to fight this battle without experiencing tremendous losses. It looks impossible. And Jericho stands there, looks difficult. Joshua is looking it over, and I don't know what's going through his mind. He might be thinking, I wish Moses were here. Who knows what's going on? But he's considering it. Maybe he's thinking about going around it. Maybe, say, maybe we could come back to this. Maybe we ought to get a little stronger first, come back and fight the big battle after we fought a few battles. He knows better than that, because if you do that, you're always going to be looking over your shoulder. Who's coming behind? It's out there. It's impenetrable. Maybe he's sitting there coming up with a battle plan. What's he going to do? How's it going to work? But nonetheless, as he stands there, something happens in this great moment where the, the incarnate Jesus brings a, a manifestation to him of himself and speaks to Joshua and gives him direct orders of how to fight this particular battle. So that's what I want to give you about six principles today. Six essentials for dealing with impossible situations in your life. Because if you don't have one, sooner or later they're going to come. Left to your own abilities, you're not going to win. Left to your own talents, you're not going to win. Some of you may be facing something like that in your life right now. Some of you may be dealing with something in your health or your home or your family, you know, your finances, who knows. But it's, it's a situation, you're, you're looking at it, you're scratching your head and you think, I just don't know how. We're going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to face this. I don't know how to handle this. Well, I'm so glad that uh, we have the Word of God, which we can go back to and learn from because God speaks to us about how to deal with impossible situations. Let me go through these six with you very quickly this morning. First of all, as Joshua does, he, he does this. He recognizes the presence of the Lord uh, on the scene. There, as the Scripture says, the man with the sword in his hand. When he was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and he looked, and there stood a man against him. There stood someone right here off to his side that he noticed, and somebody hadn't been there just a moment before, but he's not just a man. He's a man with a sword in his hand. He may represent the enemy. He may represent a foe. He could be a crisis in the moment because the sword is drawn. And Joshua responds in such an attitude of, which side are you on, is what his, 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 his position is. It. Are you for us? Are you for the Lord? Are you, are you for the enemy? To which he responds, and I'll put it in the Joe Arms terminology, I didn't come to take sides, I came to take over. Amen. You know, we always talk about who's on the Lord's side and if God be for us. Listen, the key issue about God being for us, who could be against us, is, is the issue that we are for God. All right? That's why God is for us. It's not that he's taken my side, it's that I've taken his side. And this is the big issue. It, it, well, I will I allow God to come into the situation that I am facing in my life right now and present himself as God. Because if he's present, I have everything I'm ever going to need to deal with this problem. You say, oh, but you don't know my problem. I have everything I'm ever going to need to deal with this problem. Oh, but you don't know what I'm facing. I have everything I need to deal with this situation, no matter what it is. Why? Because he's here. Amen. He is the eternal I am. So don't be preoccupied with Jericho. Don't get distraught about the problem. Don't be so overcome with the situation that you miss the presence of God and what is going on. Because if you are a child of God, if you are truly born again, saint of God, then you have what you need for every situation you will ever face at any time in your life. 
There's no place where we have to just curl up in a ball and cry and say, there's no way. Because there is a way, because we have the way. And so, so often we miss it. I remember reading about the Amazon River. You know, it's the largest river in the world. The Amazon River at the mouth is 90 miles across. That's a big river, amen? 90 miles across. There's enough water to exceed in the, in the Amazon River to exceed the combined flow of the Yangtze River, the Mississippi River, and the Nile River. That's a big river. So much water comes from the Amazon, they say that you can detect the currents of the Amazon River 200 miles out in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, one of the ironies that occurred, especially in ancient times of navigating ships in this part of the world, sailors often died in the, this part of the Atlantic for a lack of water. They get caught somewhere off this, in the South Atlantic and the windless waters there, and there would be no way to sail the ship in one way or the other. They were adrift. They were helpless. They were thirsty. There was no water. And sometimes other ships from the South Atlantic region would come alongside and ask them, what's the problem, as they called out in distress. And some of them would exclaim, well, can you spare us some water? We don't have any water to drink. Our sailors, they're dying out of thirst. Can you help us? And someone from the other ship would cry out, just lower your buckets. You're in the mouth of the Amazon River. There's fresh water. How often do we just not realize that? Because who would have thought there'd be fresh water 200 miles out in the Atlantic? How often do we feel like that we're adrift, there's no hope, there's no answer in sight, and all the time we just simply need to lower our bucket, trust God, and let God do something? And here, the children of Israel stand with a tragedy called Jericho that faces them. And what they need to do at this particular time is just call on the fount of living water, the Lord Jesus himself. Everything they need to conquer Jericho stands right in that man with the sword in his hand. First of all, we need to recognize the presence of God in our dilemma. The second thing has to do with position. Not ours, really. It's his position. Who is he? He comes as the captain of the army of the Lord. That's the reason he comes. He comes to be the leader. He comes to take over. If you do not subject yourself to his lordship, if you don't surrender to his leadership in these times, you can pray till you turn blue in the face. Nothing's going to happen. He has to be allowed his rightful place as Lord in your situation, in your life. I, I know that most of us, and I'll speak on the behalf of men more than women, because I believe that men are the worst at this, is that when we get into some kind of, of, of situation in our life, we think that we're, we're going to mentally, you know, put our calculators together and our math together, and what, what, we're going to pool our resources, and I'm going to get us through this problem. We're going we're to get through Somehow, some way, you know, I'm going to use my collective wit, talent, personality, put it all together, and wham, bam, we're going to be done. I'm going to be on the other side of this Jericho. That, that, that's not life. Sometimes life presents us some situations that you can put your resources and everybody else's resources together, and it's not going to change a thing. There's some things that if God doesn't do, it's not going to get done. I know that there's a lot of things. And, you know, if you read the story of Jacob and Isaac, Jacob was excellent at this. He could always kind of weasel his way in and out of things. But there's going to be some things in life that you, don't, you just can't weasel in and out of. And you're going to have to deal with the man with the sword in his hand. And you're going to have to come to the place and saying, all right, I have need of, of God in my life. I can't do anything about this. There's nothing I can do. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of talent. There's no amount of charm. I just need to come to the place where I avail myself completely over to Christ. He becomes the Lord. I'm not in charge anymore. God is on the throne in my heart and in my life. Jesus is Lord. We take our place that we call the crucified life, where I reckon that I am dead and I'm only alive in Jesus Christ. So I've moved my place to the cross, and I operate now from a different location where Jesus is Lord of my heart and Lord of my life, and I choose to live that crucified life. I love what A.W. Tozer said about the crucified life in speaking about it. A.W. Tozer made this comment. He says, you know, the people who are crucified with Christ have, made three distinct, have three distinct marks about their life. Number one is they're facing only one direction. No looking back, there's no, there, there's no going back to where we were. I have one goal and one goal only, and that is Jesus Christ is Lord in charge of all of my life. Number two, you understand there's no turning back. I mean, it's like the old song used to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. That's where you come to. 
When you really say, I'm serious about a Christian life. I'm serious about a walk with God. I'm serious about my relationship with Jesus. There's no place to turn back. And the third thing Tozer says, you no longer have plans of your own. I'm not out trying to fit my plan into God's plan or manipulate God to take my side in this situation. What does God want? What is his purpose and what is his will in this? I recognize his position as the Lord of Lords, as the captain, and therefore I relinquish any authority that I thought I might have had, and he gets complete control of my life. The third point is this. This process is unique. You have to realize the processes of God in your life and just how does God work. The scriptures make it ultimately clear that his ways are not our ways. And sometimes we have a hard time understanding this. And sometimes, to be honest with you folks, it takes a Jericho to get us to the place to realize that my, my plan's not working here. You know. In fact, it was, it's that point I came to in my life when I really gave my heart to Jesus. When I really got serious my, with, with God in my life, I just got honest with God and said, you know, I've done a terrible job at being God here in my own life. I can't do this, and I don't want to live this way any longer. And I'm sick of this. And I surrendered my life to Christ. And a new life began. I began to realize now I'm going to choose to live my life by, this, by, by, a, by a higher, more noble way and a more noble plan. I'm not going to try to get God to fit into my projects anymore. I want to find out what his project is and fit in with what he's got going. Now, by the way, sometimes we don't understand that his ways are not our ways. They're completely different. I love what 1 Corinthians 1.27 says. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise which makes you and I candidates, amen, that we can join in on the plan of God. And I don't have to have what the world mandates for me to be successful anymore. I just need to surrender my heart and life to God, and I can discover success by His standard. Now, this is interesting because the more I looked at this particular story on Joshua and Jericho, I kind of started feeling sorry for Joshua, knowing that he has to go back at this point in time and tell the other captains and generals in the army what the plan is. You remember the plan, don't you? The plan was we're going to march around the city for one day and we're not going to say a thing. We're going to send the priest out and the follower of the people and the army's going to follow and we're all just going to march around the city. Yeah, they may laugh at us. They may make jokes, you know. Uh, for, they may hurl stuff from the city. We're, just going to walk, we're not going to respond. We're, not, we're, not, we're just going to walk around the city and be quiet for a second for seven days. On the seventh day, we're going to do it seven times. But on the seventh time around, the priests are going to blow the trumpet, and then we're going to shout, and the walls are just going to fall flat. Can you, can you imagine the look on their face? I mean, this is not fairy tale, all right? This is a reality. This really took place in time and history, and there was a moment when Joshua marched in that tent, set down his commanders and his chiefs and his, you know, his, his staff, and said, here's the plan. I got an idea. This is going to work. It's going to be great. God gave me this plan. I've been talking to God, and here's what God says we're going to do. Can you imagine the look on their face when he got to that last part? And then we're just going to shout a real big shout, and the walls are going to fall flat. I, I can see when I'm kind of kicking one another on the table. That's about the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. You would have said it. I mean, you might not have said it. You thought it. That's about the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. And who told you this? Where did you get this plan? Oh, God told you, that's right. You saw why I wouldn't either. Yes, you, I mean, listen to what God says to us. Very clear word we have today, how we live our life. If you want to really live, you've got to die. You've got to die to yourself, die to your will, die to your plans, die to your ambitions, and come alive in Jesus. I don't want to do that. That's the way it works. Well, you, you're over here, you got your little money bet in front of you, you got your, your paycheck, you put it in the bank, you say, oh, that's, I got my money, I got my resources, and God says, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give. Uh, I can't do that. You want me to give a portion? Just give? I mean, what do I get in return? What am I buying? What do I get out of this deal? You said you had a need, so here's the way to, here's the way to have a, 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 a means to the end of getting. You have to give. If I want to live, i got to die. That's just stupid. Anybody in the world knows you just don't give stuff away to get something. It doesn't work that way in the world. But we don't live by this world's standards. So if God's saying, if you, want to meet your, if you want to have your needs met, then you learn how to be a giver. If you want to learn how to live, then you've got to learn how to die. And therein lies the foolishness that the world does not comprehend. And it's over and over and over again. 
throughout your marriage, throughout your finance, in relationship to your children. Over and over again, God gives us principles which just don't stand the world's test at all. The world says, that's ridiculous. If somebody offends me, I'm going to offend them back. If somebody cusses me, I'm going to cuss them back. I'm not going to forgive. They don't deserve my forgiveness. We don't get it. You have to realize you're going to win this battle. You have to understand the processes of God. They're not your ways. And God gives us this ridiculous plan. And I'm sure there's probably a good old Baptist sitting around the table saying, yeah, I ain't, yeah, I ain't march around the table for, to march around that building for six days. Well, you can't even get a Baptist church two days a week, much less six days. <laughs> Amen. Sunday morning, Sunday night, my, Wednesday. What's the matter with you people down there? Six days is not going to... I almost see some Methodist guys ending up being dignified. Saying, <coughs> Certainly, if we can't blow those ugly ram's horns. He wants us to blow the ram's horns? We're not going to blow the ram's... But why not use the... We have some beautiful silver t trumpets in the temple, don't we? we? In the tabernacle, we have these beautiful horns. Why don't we sound the lovely horns? Not those ugly sounding ram's horns. They have such a nasty tone. And uh, there's some Pentecostal, I'm sure, just sweating it. Ain't no way I'm going to be quiet for six days. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And then there's always that seeker sensitive group over in the back corners. Well, you know, I think, I, I think, Brother Joshua, we need to reconsider this because, you know, this whole plan might be offensive to somebody. So we don't want to do it that way. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, folks. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And we face Jericho's, whether you realize it or not. Sometimes they're in the forms of physical things. Sometimes they're in the form of emotional things. Sometimes they're in the form of spiritual things as we fight in the realm of the demonic. And there's things that come against our life. Your ways aren't going to work. You have to trust the will and the way and the word of God if there's going to be victory in your life. Whether it's trumpets, silver horns, ram's horns, seven times, whatever it may be. The Bible says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Realize this process is not your process. The fourth thing is this. It has to do with his promise. You know, if God said it, that pretty much just settles the whole thing. Remember the bumper sticker, if God said it, you know, I believe it, that settles it. No, if God said it, that settles it. Now, if you want to see the fulfillment of it in your life, then there's going to be a part of active faith. And you have to believe. I love the way the Lord puts this. It shall come to pass. Let me say it again. It shall come. When you do this, when you do what I've told you to do, it shall come to pass. And it goes on, and the wall of the city shall fall flat down, and the people shall ascend, every man straight before him. Well, God said, I will do this. I will do this. Now, you just do what I've told you to do. Now, this is the whole act of faith in our life, which is based upon the Word of God, which is based upon His promises. But as you study Scripture, you begin to discover that all these promises of God are what we call reciprocal. In other words, it requires something. Now, God's done everything. Don't, don't misunderstand that you've got to have some great value in your life. But God is wanting you to believe, and God is wanting you to trust. Everything's already been done that needs to be done to remedy your, your situation. God has paid for salvation so that you don't have to die and go to hell. God has redeemed you with his own blood. God has made you part of his family. God has committed himself to be your father, your provider, your protector. But he's saying here, I have a promise that I'm going to make you, and if you'll respond to this promise, you'll see the fulfillment of it. See, there's this word that God's given us. It's a powerful word. And we have to come to the place to realize, here's the promise. What's God want me to do? Where's my responsibility? What is God desiring of me? What will demonstrate my love for him, my affection, for him, and my trust in him is my heavenly father. If I want to receive forgiveness of sins, I'm in guilt. My heart is broken. I'm facing shame. And if I want to be forgiven and come out from under the load of that sin, God said, hey, it's all been provided for. The blood's been shed. Jesus has redeemed. But now, if you confess your sins, you'll be forgiven and you'll be cleansed from all unrighteousness. So I want to experience cleansing and forgiveness. Well, here's this beautiful promise of God. There's a point of claiming. There's a point of obeying. There's a point of believing and trusting God. If we confess our sins, if my people, which are called by my name, will repent, will humble themselves, will turn from their wicked way, will seek my face, then I will heal their land. How many of the promises of God are just so based upon the same kind of mindset of, of, this, this, of, of the promise of God? Here's this beautiful, glorious blessing God gives, and now he's saying, come receive it. 
Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. He's not going to fill it when it's shut. Simple obedience, simple faith. You see, there's, this, there's the word of faith, but there's also the work of faith. And the work of faith is simple response to the promises that God has made to you. Will you obey? Will you follow? Will you walk with Him? Will you trust Him? I don't somehow feel equipped for this. Just trust Him and you'll have everything you need. Stories of, of the great uh, missionary and William Carey who became a missionary to, to India. And William Carey's father kind of took him aside and said, Listen, son, I know that you're interested in being this pioneer missionary to India, but you need to realize, son, that you don't possess any qualifications, nor have you have any academic preparations for such an enormous task that lies ahead of you. What do you think you're going to do? What makes you think that you're fit for such a task? Carey responded to his father three simple words. I can plod. Now, if we took it back to the vernacular today, it means he says, I can, I can walk with God. I can trust. I can obey. I can follow. Very simple. Those are all the words that define what faith really is. Based upon the promise of God, I can trust. I can believe. I can surrender. I can follow. I can plod. And I believe with all my heart that the walls of God, the, the walls that are out there will be brought down by the power of God as we move forward and as we continue to trust Him. Not sit back and try to figure out the remedy for ourselves and somehow manipulate situations in our life using our abilities or whatever it might be to somehow come up with something. You're going to have to trust God. And sometimes we're waiting for the wall to fall before we walk forward, and it doesn't work that way. You've got to walk forward in spite of the wall. You've got to move forward in faith. Hudson Taylor went to China, another great missionary. He made a voyage on a sailing vessel. And as they were coming off the southern Malayan Peninsula near the island of Sumatra, the boat just stopped, it was, remember it's a sailing vessel, it just stopped midwater. The wind ceased, there's no more wind. The captain, knowing that the missionary was aboard, went to the door of Hudson Taylor's room, knocked on it. Hudson Taylor opened the door, and there stood the captain of the ship who said, Mr. Taylor, I understand, you know, that you're a believer. And he says, we, we have a problem. We have no wind. And that we're drifting toward an island where I fear that the people are cannibals, you know. And we could lose our life. We need wind, and we need to get it soon. Taylor said, well, what do you want me to do? What do you think I can do? The captain said, I understand that you believe God, and you believe in God, and I want you to pray for wind. After a moment's pause, Hudson Taylor said, All right, Captain, I will, on one condition. You have to set the sail. Well, Captain says, that's ridiculous. If I give the order to set the sail when there's no wind, my men are going, the sailors on board the ship, they're all going to laugh at me and think I've lost my mind. Taylor kept insisting, if you want me to pray, you're going to have to set the sail. To which he agreed, and he left, and he set the sail. Forty-five minutes later, the captain came knocking on Taylor's door and says, All right, you can stop praying now. we got more wind than we know what to do with. <laughs> what is it in your life that you're hesitating because you want something out there perhaps to change before you do what God wants you to do? You need to just quit waiting. And you need to move forward. God's given you a word. God's given you a direction. You, you need to quit trying to figure it all out and just move forward. Whether well, that's in your finances, in your family, in your relationship to your husband, your wife, your children, your job, just move forward. As, as, as we said, about well, you can plod. You believe His promise. Then you move forward. The fifth principle is this, out of this story is this, and it's very simple. It's realizing His, his power. That God is able to do the impossible. And I think somehow we've, we've lost the context or the concept of the impossible in our lives. God still does impossible things. Some of you in the years of your walk with God have seen what I'm talking about. You've seen the impossible. Some of you are yet young in your faith and maybe you haven't seen the impossible. Well, let me tell you, you just haven't realized what has already happened. What was impossible is for you to get in heaven. What was impossible was for you to be saved. What was impossible, no way whatsoever, there's no way in your ability, your talents, your wit, your charm, your strength, your energy, you're ever going to get yourself into heaven. I don't care how moral, decent, upright, how many churches you join, you can get baptized, sprinkled, confirmed, spray starch, I don't care. It's, it's not going to work. You're not going to save yourself. 
There's a miracle that has to take place called regeneration and rebirth so that when you come in faith to the Word of God and you repent, as Scripture says, surrendering your life to Christ, in that moment of surrender and humility before God, this miracle happens whereby you are saved and you are set apart for the glory of God. Your life is changed. Your vision changes. Your ears change. Your heart changes. An impossible thing just took place. You've been born again. Now, if God can do that, He can certainly do this little stuff in your life. Jericho is no big deal in regards to your salvation. He's powerful. Joshua 6, 20, the people shouted, and when the priest blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass, that when they heard the sound of the trumpet, the people did what they were, they shouted, and the wall fell down flat. It just disappeared. It's gone. Right into the ground. In fact, archaeologists will tell you that this, this, is they, Jericho's been one of those cities, one of the oldest cities in the world has been rebuilt so many times. There's just that one period where they've dug down and the walls just seem to be below the city foundations. Like elevator doors almost. Ground opens up, <laughs> walls are gone. I don't have to climb over 40 feet of rubble. I'm just going in and taking possession. It's a miracle. It's the power of God. It's the grace of God. And with God, all things are possible. You know that verse, several times it says that in the New Testament. One of the places it says when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, how can I be saved? How can I be saved? You know, I've been good all my life. He starts going through the law, which Jesus basically just kind of calls him a liar in a very subtle way. Oh, well, then have you kept all the commandments? Oh, yeah, I've kept them all since my youth. Then you go sell everything you've got and come follow me. What was Jesus doing? Simply pointing out that he was a liar. He had a, he had a God. He'd broken the very first commandment. His God was his money. He was materialist. He thought that was the source of life. That was the source of his hope. That was the source of peace in his life. I've got to have money. So the Lord says to him, let's deal with this issue. Now, it hadn't been long before that the Lord already made a commitment about this giving. Given it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. All right? That promise has already been made. Now, now, here's the thing. He walks away. He doesn't like what's been said. And then Peter turns to Jesus because the Jews had this mindset, man, if you were prosperous like that, you already had blessings of God on your life. And so Peter says, well, Lord, if he can't be saved, look how spiritual he is. He's so religious, then who can be saved? Jesus' response, with men it's not possible. You can't save yourself. But with God, all things are possible. But with God, and this is what we're talking about, we're talking about the context of His power. With Him, everything's possible. Don't shake your head in disbelief. It'll never work. It'll never happen. They'll never change. With God, all things are possible. He's still a big God. He hasn't diminished due to time. All right? He's still God. He's still on the throne. He's no less God today than He was when the walls fell flat. With God, all things are possible. The last point of this simple six-point sermon is this. Uh, hit it for me. There it goes. His prize. And I don't want you to miss this. It says here, you know, so the Lord was, was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Now, Joshua's fame is noised, but I believe also the Lord's noise is, the fame is, is noised. About. In fact, it was so well known what had happened here, there are certain people in the promised land, in Canaan, who realize what's going on because they've seen what's happened, and so they put on this big show like they're from a far distant country and come try to make a, a treaty with, with the children of Israel, and, and they dupe them into making this, this covenant relationship with them. Why were they doing that? Because they were scared to death. They were afraid. I really believe that we ought to have a testimony about our life that the fame of the Lord is noised about through our life so that people know, hey, if I, have, if I need an answer, there's somebody I know I can go to. If, I'm looking, if I've got a problem, there's somebody I can talk to. That they can come to us. If there's solutions, that we, have, we may not have to look, but we can certainly point them in the right direction. But this, this is the beauty of our salvation. God raises us up. God sets us aside. This was God's plan for the nation of Israel first and foremost, to be the evangelicals to the world to spread his fame and his word abroad. Now in the church, it's the same relationship that we're here so that he might be well known, so that he might have precedence in the world about it, but it's manifest through our lives. And this is, this is the beauty of, of my relationship to Jesus Christ. I get all the benefits. The prize is mine. The blessing's mine. 
I mean, I, I tell people all the time, this thing of Christianity, it's, it's an exchange of lives. Jesus gave his for you, now you surrender yours to him. And by the way, he gets the bad end of that deal. Some of you don't know that yet. He, I get a far better deal in all of this. I have the grace, the blessing, eternal life, and there are hundreds of benefits that are mentioned in the scripture for those who give their lives to him. In this instance, the walls fell flat. In this instance, there's victory. But even greater than that, in our life, we get to know him. We get to walk with him. We, it, we get to have his relationship, the fellowship, the beauty of knowing him far surpasses anything else and everything else. The goal of God for your life is to bring you into this place where you do know him and you walk with him. As he loves you, you love him. And you experience the prize, the beautiful reward of faith in knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The last quote I'll give you as we close the message is from B.J. Miller. Dr. Miller made this statement. It's a great deal easier to do that which God gives us to do, no matter how hard it might be than the responsibility of not doing it. You may be facing a very difficult situation. You may have something like that you face very soon. And maybe it looks so difficult and God's called you to do a certain thing in all this. And you're saying, oh, I just don't know if I can do that. I don't know if it'll work. I don't know if I have the means to do that. I don't know if I have the, the ability. Hey, it's a great deal easier to do what God's telling you to do. It's a great deal easier. This is a lesson we should have learned as children. It's a great deal easier to do what's right than keep putting off, keep going our own way. It's like Saul on the road to Damascus. Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goad. Why do you keep kicking the cactus, so to say? It's painful to keep going on the way you're going on when it's far more blessed and glorious and greater and rewarding for you to surrender it all to Jesus Christ and let him be the king and let him be the Lord. Why are you fighting? Why are you fighting? There's not too many believers that I've ever met in my life that didn't say at some point in their life when the lights really came on their life, they said something like this, I can't believe I was so stupid. Or I can't believe I put this off so long. I can't believe I resisted God so much. You see people that are running towards hell like it were heaven. You know? When you ought to be running toward heaven. You're running from Jesus like he's the devil. When he's the one who said, I've come that you might have life. And the devil's the one who comes to steal and to kill and destroy. Even as a Christian, it's so easy to get caught in that mold of just being, let's be religious, let's do our thing, but leave my life to me. I don't mind Jesus on Sunday, but I want to run my life. It doesn't work that way, and it'll never work that way for you. Let's stand with our heads bowed today. Today, as we come to this last Sunday of the year and think about the year that's to, 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 to come before us, I really want you to take account to where you are right now in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ.